So welcome back. We're kind of wrapping up the Holy Week and uh, Easter. And before I jump into today, I really want to look back into yesterday and just tell you how thankful I was because Sam walked us through the story after Easter. It is a really important part of the foundation for the disciples as they move into building God's kingdom. Some really important parts. I really appreciated how Sam walked us through that story through the eyes of the disciples. It had to be such an intense time for them. They did not fully understand what was happening until years and months later. Really intense. So I hope you really have enjoyed the walk that we've taken you through. We've tried to take you through day by day of Holy Week. Obviously, Palm Sunday started it, and then Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Saturday, um, I'm sorry, Easter, and then yesterday, really foundational moments. Today, we're going to jump into a scripture reference, really talking about what happens when Jesus ascended into heaven. I don't know if you've ever asked yourself, but one of the things I've asked myself, okay, so Palm Sunday happened, Holy Week happened, Easter happened, now what? What does this mean to me? How do these stories of over 2,000 years ago, how do they apply to me? How do they apply to us today? We're going to jump into that because these stories aren't stories of old that are just on old documents that we brush off, blow off the dust, and bring them out once a year. They're supposed to be stories that transform us. They're supposed to be stories that change the way we look at life and what it means to follow Christ. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into Scripture right now. I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. I'm going to start with Matthew chapter 28. We're going to read verses 16 to 20. And then I'm going to read Acts 1 verses 12 to 13. And then we're going to go into Acts 2 verses 1 to 4. And then we're going to drop down into Acts 2 verse 40. So I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. But I would hope at home you would break out scriptures and read all of these chapters. Let's start with Matthew 28. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee. Now remember, Judas Iscariot would have uh, been the Judas that betrayed Jesus. So he goes off and hangs himself. So now they're down to 11. And going to the mountains or the mountain where Jesus had said they would find him. There they met him and worshiped him. But some of them weren't even sure it was really Jesus. He told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples in the, of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And then teach them these, uh, teach these new disciples to obey the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, that I am with you always, even to the end of this world. Now we're going to jump into Acts 1, verse 12. They were at the Mount of Olives, Olives when this happened, so now they walked a half a mile back to Jerusalem and held a prayer meeting in an upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Now we're going to go to Acts 2, verse 1. Seven weeks had gone by since Jesus' death and resurrection, and the day of Pentecost had now arrived. As the believers met together that day, suddenly there was a sound like a roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on their heads. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in languages they did not know, for the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now we're going to drop to verse 40. Then Peter preached a long sermon, telling about Jesus and strongly urging his listeners to save themselves from the evils of their nation. And those who believed Peter were baptized, about 3,000 in all. They joined with other believers in regular attendance at the apostles' teaching sessions and at the communion services and prayer meetings. A deep sense of awe was with them all, and the apostles did many miracles. And all the believers met together constantly and shared everything with each other, selling their possessions, dividing with those in need. They worshiped together regularly at the temple each day, met in small groups in homes for communion, and shared their meals with great joy and thankfulness praising God. The whole city was favorable to them, and each day God added to them all who were being saved. What's happening? Well, what's going on is Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, and in his absence, Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is just going viral with all these disciples, and it's going viral all over the city. You're literally seeing the beginning of the first church. 
So what is happening when Jesus is ascending into heaven? He has this moment with the disciples. And again, I don't know if they fully understood what was happening at that moment. But what was happening was the mission that God gave Jesus was now being delegated. It was being given over into the disciples. Um, Jesus could only do what one man could do. But now in his absence, he's handing the first church, the mission, the Holy Spirit over the disciples to say, now you go do and start the first church. And we see a glimpse of this when Peter speaks and over 3,000 people respond and believe in Jesus as the Son of God and are baptized. I believe this story should radically change the way we do church. I think it should absolutely transform our understanding of what it means to be a disciple of Christ, someone who wants to follow after Christ. The mission of God that he gave to Jesus, he gave to the disciples, and that's a mission that God has given us today. That's why at MRC, we like to say that our unique identity here is that we are passionate, we're relentless, and we're unapologetic to go after people far from God. And we want to empower Christians to join that mission. And we challenge every person who says MRC is their church home. We challenge them to make five commitments. We want you to love God. We want you to love um, others. We want you to love growth, serving, and giving. And when we get together in our services, um, back when we used to get together with our services, and we will someday too. But when we get together with our services, what, are the, what is it that we say to people? We say that we want them to experience the presence of God. We pray early in the morning, dear God, come. And in some way, we want you to be real for us today. And so why do we do church this way? Well, I want to be clear about this. The reason we do church this way, the reason we believe what we believe, the reason we ask people to make these commitments is because we read scripture. We read what Jesus said to the disciples and we believe it. And we're trying to live that out today. We have been forever changed by his grace and his mercy. We're completely different people because he interrupted our lives and we're not worthy of it. We, I, we look at ourselves, we don't like who we are, but God comes, like Sam said in his message yesterday, how many times did disciples blow it and Jesus was right there to love them? That's our story. And he just continues to continue to pour into this place with his love and his grace and his mercy. And we believe that God gave us the mission to tell other people about his grace and his mercy. This is so foundational to the Christian faith. It is so foundational to what we do here. That story of over 2,000 years ago is still impacting to us today. I wanna to be clear about this before we move on. Why do we do what we do? We do it because we read scripture. We saw what Jesus said, and we want to continue that into today. Stop and think about this for a second. What do your family and friends and community need today? What, what do they need around us? Well, they need to know that they can't earn their way into heaven with human effort. They need to know that the curse of sin and death has been broken because of Jesus' sacrifice. They need to know about God's out of control, reckless and passionate love for them. They need to know that God knows their name. God's on their side. They need to know that there's healing and there's rest in this relationship with Christ. To be more clear, um, I, I think, some of the things our community is not looking for, things they don't need. They don't need people pointing fingers at them. They don't need big worded theologians giving them intellectual double talk. They don't need more things to do. They need a relationship with Christ. And I'm just gonna give you some questions now to kind of process, and then I'm gonna close with one last point. The first question I wanna ask you is, when Jesus says, go make disciples, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? Do you think Jesus was just saying it to those 11 men and some of the people gathered around them? Or do you think Jesus was sending us a message? Do you think you need to personalize that into today? Um, do you think that was given to everyone? Or do you think that's just for paid pastors? So when Jesus says, go make disciples, who is he talking to? For you, do you see a connection, a clear connection between I'm going to make commitments to my local church, and when I make those commitments to the local church, that is me joining the mission of Christ. Do you, do you see a connection there? The connection of I'm going to love God, love others, love growing, love serving, love giving. Those commitments we make as an individual couple or as a family, 
When I make that commitment, I'm making a commitment because that's actually a commitment to the mission of Christ. Do you see that connection or not? Let me ask you this. Who do you know who needs to know that God loves them? Who do you know in your friend group, your family, maybe people you go to school with, who do you know who needs to know about the love and the grace of God? Are you praying for them? Are you building a relationship with them? Are you just loving them? One last thing I want to share before I close this out, and it's really, really important. I want you to notice, if you reread Acts, I want you to notice that the Holy Spirit came and he made the difference. He empowered the disciples. Then they went out and did something. The Holy Spirit came first. It's the, God is always the foundational part before we do anything. So again, the Holy Spirit comes, and then they go and do something. Holy Spirit came, and then Peter preached. The Holy Spirit came, then 3,000 people came to know Jesus. I want to share this because this is really, really important. For you and I, that means Christianity is not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily about us making things happen. It, it's not. Sometimes people with good hearts who deeply love God, they feel like we need to make things happen. We need to get busier. We need to get more activities. We need to get more programs. We must make things happen. Well, based on scripture, based on the first church, what do we see happening? Happening, We see that they gathered together in a room and they were praying. The Holy Spirit came and anointed them and it empowered them to do what God was already doing. Again, following Jesus isn't about making things happen all the time. We're not against doing things. I'm just saying that following Jesus isn't about making things happen. It's not up to us. It's more about walking with God. It's more about meeting God on a regular basis, allowing him to love us, allowing him to kind of shape and mold our hearts. And then we walk into every day with our eyes open, asking ourselves, what is God doing around me already? How can I join God in what he's doing? It's a really important part because we have seen some dear brothers and sisters who love God. They have burned out because they've gone ahead of the Holy Spirit saying, we have to do it. We have to build it. We have to do the thing. And then they get burned out because the Holy, they, they kind of outran the Holy Spirit. One of the great places to start if you're home and, and uh, of course, we're under the quarantine right now, you'd say, well, how can I fulfill the mission of Christ? Well, let me just share real quickly, and I'm going to close. I think a great place to start with the mission of Christ is your heart. That's why around here at MRC, we're always talking about relationship with Christ, allowing his love to come in and shape and mold your heart. The great place to start is allowing God to come in and just love you and build that personal relationship with Christ. I think after you're working on that, another uh, place to start, a great place to start, would be all the relationships that are closest to you right now. Maybe with your spouse, maybe with your kids, and maybe with your parents. Maybe the greatest mission field that you're on right now is your personal heart and the, rela and the relationships of your family around you. So yes, you can start this mission today at home under quarantine. And what Sam and I want to do is we wrapped up Holy Week and Easter and the story after Easter um, and the Great Commission. We want you to think through about what God was up to. Why did God send Jesus? What happened? What did Jesus say to his disciples? And how does that impact us today? We pray that the Holy Spirit literally just moves in on you, connects with your heart with the bigger story of what's going on. We believe this story should radically change the way we do church. It should radically change the way we view following after Christ. One of the things I want to do right now is I just want to pray for you, and then we're just going to tap out. Dear Heavenly Father, as we leave the most beautiful story of Holy Week and Easter, I just pray that the reality of who God is and what he was doing through Jesus would fully impact our hearts. I pray that the scriptures would just explode on our hearts and our minds. I pray that our understanding of who God is, our understanding of church, our understanding of what it means to follow after him would radically change. Father, please come and anoint every person watching this with the Holy Spirit, that there would be a peace and a power and a strength deep inside them. Father, would you come and do something in our community that no one could take credit for? In Jesus' name, amen. Man, we love you. We'll see you next week.